Hi, I'm Garrett with IDC Woodcraft and I'd like to welcome you to this video where you and I are going to do a deep dive review into the long mill CNC router. If you're in the market for a CNC router, by the time you're done with this video, you're going to know everything there is to know about the long mill and a whole lot more. What we're going to do in this video is we are going to look at the long mill from a bird's eye view all the way down to basically the microscopic level. We're going to look at the company and then we are going to start talking about the machine, what you get with it, how it's built, the assembly of it. We're going to start to test drive it and we're going to push it really hard. And finally, we'll get into the cost and I'm going to give you my take on this. But before we get into this, I want to talk to you about a couple of things. First of all, who am I? And second of all, if you didn't notice, this is a rather long video. So let's talk about that part first. Why is a review video so long? You're in a market for a CNC router and ready to spend a significant amount of money. So knowing everything there is to know about a CNC router is really important. That's why I did this video so deep. But there's something else about this video. If you're relatively new and trying to decide what CNC router to get, you probably don't know everything you want to look for. And so it's kind of confusing. There's a lot of brands out there and sometimes you might have even gone into Facebook groups and asked people, what's the best CNC router for me to get? Well, that sends people into total confusion because everybody and their brother gives a completely different answer. This video, as part of this review, is intended to educate you so you know what to be looking for and not have to ask those questions that you can go to these different sites and say, oh, I don't want that, I don't want that, this is no good, this one's a good one, on and on and on. And you don't feel so confused. So now, with that being said, who am I? My name is Garrett Frommy, and I've been creating videos to teach you, the beginner or the intermediate, how to work with the CNC router, from design concepts to actual designing, to getting that design over to your router, setting up your jobs, router bits, what to use, what they, how they are used, uh, what to look for, what to not use, and uh, I talk about other accessory equipment and of course the CNC routers themselves. My career started many years ago, as you can probably tell. In my first 20 years, I worked as a journeyman CNC machinist. Basically, I ran a lot of CNC machines and thousands and thousands and thousands of parts. But as a journeyman, I was responsible for a lot of stuff. Number one was setting up the order of operations for the parts that were going to be run. I would write G-code programs. I'd work with the CAD CAM systems. I would be responsible for the tooling that we were going to be using and making sure the proper tooling was in place. Sometimes even had to design custom tooling to, to make the parts that we made and eventually design fixtures that would hold the parts in the machines. My next 20 years was spent as a process design engineer. I would work with companies and troubleshoot any kind of manufacturing issues they were having that was causing quality issues. My job was to fix that issue, find out what it was and fix it, make their process more robust so it didn't happen again, so the products that went out their door got into your hands in good quality and free of defects. Anywhere from flashlights to cars, I've been through them all, airplanes too by the way. Along the way, I've had three successful businesses. And as a hobby, I was a woodworker. So when I finally left the workforce, it was a natural course to move into CNC routers and start shooting videos. I have the heart of a teacher and I want to pass on all this knowledge that I have to you so you can become an amazing creator with uh, as little trouble as possible. So that's why I do what I do. Now, one other thing I want to share with you before we get into this review is why of all the good CNC routers out there, did a long mill end up on my workbench to make my projects? Well, that's because of you. Yeah, you're responsible for me getting this machine. Let me explain. Like I said, I've created a lot of videos and I've got a lot of experience and I teach a lot of stuff. And over time, I've found that people put a lot of weight in the things that I say. And also, stuff that's in the videos that I create or that I talk about or endorse, you sometimes end up buying. What happens if something doesn't meet your expectations is, I hear about it. Yeah, I'll either get a complaint email or we will be on the phone or through email troubleshooting the issue, even though it's not my piece of equipment. So that placed a certain sense of responsibility on me to make sure that whatever I got, when I upgraded my CNC router to what I've gotten, that it was something that I would be completely comfortable with in the videos that I create for you from now on. So with that being said, when I was upgrading my CNC router, 
I had to have four very stringent criteria that all four criteria had to be met before I even made my selection. The first one was the rigidity of the machine. When it comes to machine build, the worst enemy in a CNC router is rigidity. If you have a machine that lacks some rigidity, that's going to reflect in the quality of the cuts of the projects that you make. And when you have bad cut quality, you're sanding that project afterwards when you shouldn't have to. The machine should have left the finish to near sanding free finish. Sometimes you have to do a little bit of work to it, but not like uh, what we left if you don't have a rigid machine. You'd spend more time sanding than you would be actually making the part. So the machine had to be very strong. Number two was it had to be production capable. A lot of people get into CNC routers because they want to make money. They want to start a business with it. That means it needed to be repeatable as far as its cuts and be able to run 8, 10, 12 hours a day, day after day, without wearing out in a short period of time. The third criteria is very important as well. The, co the company, the customer support after the sale. Sometimes problems come up and you want that resource, the experts, the makers of the machine, to be there to help you out resolve that as fast as possible. And I've got to tell you, you would be surprised at the number of machines that you probably know about that don't have good quality customer service afterwards. And the consensus was reflecting that. That was the fourth criteria. The consensus was going through Facebook group after Facebook group after Facebook group of all these different machines and seeing what people were saying. This is where it really shows up as to whether people are happy or, or having trouble with their machine or um, various other things. How the, how the company treats them. And that, over time, was really starting to paint some pictures and really chopped a lot of machines off the list. And one of the other things that was on these Facebook posts all the time are pictures. People are always showing pictures of their projects, their machines, and that speaks a million words about the machine. I can tell from my own experience, by looking at a project, if there was an issue, whether it was the setup issue of the person who they just didn't know something that they needed to do or that the machine was given bad cut quality. So when that was done, I was narrowed down to three good machines. So I had to figure out which one I was going to get because I wasn't going to buy three machines. I wanted one machine and which one was going to top all the other two. It really came down to what I feel. I want a company that has a lot of integrity and really truly cares about me. So it kind of went beyond customer service, where they know that I'm a person. They know that I've just spent a couple grand on them. They know that I'm their bread and butter. They can feel my pain when I'm writing that check to buy a machine that I'm hoping is going to solve some dreams. So that meant getting on the phone and just talking to people and ultimately trying to get to the top, the owners of the company. The first company that I called. It felt very cold, mechanical, uh, like they just didn't care about me. In fact, I checked them off the list right away because we want people to care about us. We're the ones writing the check. So the second company I felt was personable, uh, very comfortable, got off the phone with good feeling, got up to the vice president, never got to the owner, but I felt good. So they stayed on the list. It was when I got to Long Mill that things started to change. It kind of went like this. Got on the phone. Hey, Andy. Andy's one of the owners. There's somebody on the phone that'd like to talk to you about the long mill. Okay, I'll be there in just a minute. Huh? It turned out, as I found out a little bit later, that the employees, the techs, uh, people at long mill, all of them, I guess, work at the same bench, including the owners, where they all work together to help each other and to be able to help you. So if one can't really solve a problem, the next one's on the phone with you to solve the problem. But the cool thing was, it was like, the president's right there, the owner, right? I could get right to him. So that really surprised me, but there's something that took me over the edge a little bit further. It's this feeling like, as I'm talking to them, they wanted to know what I wanted to do with the CNC router. It kind of felt like this, that if I wanted to make these big, big pieces uh, for furniture that was gonna take up a, a, a lot of cut space, and their machine wouldn't be capable, I felt like they were gonna be saying, our machine isn't for you. You need to go with this type of machine and with these features in it, and these are the two companies you need to go to. That leaves me with a really good feeling, like the company really wants me to have the, uh, to get exactly what I want to fulfill my needs. So that's why, in the end, 
long mill has ended up on my workbench to make my projects. And I am totally comfortable creating videos with this machine in those videos from now on. So that was pretty long. And I got to hand it to you for hanging around. I thought it was really important to share that with you because in the end, we truly want to know what we're getting into because we are spending a lot of money to make this happen with dreams. And as part of my dream is to help you make your dreams come true. And so that's something that I needed from the company that I bought, purchased a machine from. So in the end, that's why this machine is sitting here. So with all that being said, hats off to you for hanging out. And now we're going to get into the review of this machine. We are going to cover the machine from top down. We're going to talk a little bit about long mill themselves. And we're going to get into the machine itself. And we're going to come down into driving this machine, pushing it really, really hard. And finally, we're going to talk about the cost and my final take on this. So with that being said, let's get started. Long Mill is made by a company called CNC Labs. They are up in Toronto, Canada, and it's owned by two engineers, young guys, named Andy Lee and Chris Thorogood. They've been in business for about seven years. They released the Long Mill two years ago from the published date of this video. And in that period of time, the Long Mill has made its way into the top four CNC machines in this class, which from a business perspective is really good. From what I understand, they did none or very little marketing, which means that they got there by word of mouth. That says a lot for a company. Now the long mill comes in three variants, the 12 by 12, the 12 by 30, and the 30 by 30. Every one of them is the exact same design. The difference is the actual cutting area that you can make your projects on. So a 12 by 12 this virtually allows you to cut on a 12 by 12 inch area. The 12 by 30 then means you can cut on a 12 inch by 30 inch area. And then there's the 30 inch by 30 inch area, which is the machine we're looking at here. The 12 by 12 has a cutting area about like this. And you can compare that with the size of my hand. So you can see it's fairly limited in what you can do. The 12 by 30 has a cutting area like this. So you can see there's a lot more flexibility and you can make some decent signs with that size. The 30 by 30 has this size cutting area. So you can see it's quite deep and quite wide. Now when it comes to the size of the cutting areas of the different variations of a long mill, the cutting area will determine the size of the machine. So a 12 by 12 machine will be about this wide. The 12 by 30 will be this wide and this deep and the 30 by 30 you see here how big it is. So that's one of the things to know that it's the same design, it's just a different size machine. Now one of the things I want to touch base here is just a little piece of advice coming from a lot of experience. What I see with a lot of new people who are just getting ready to buy a machine, they allow their budget to dictate the machine that they choose. Now, I get it, budget is a determining factor. What a lot of people don't do is take into consideration the, the bigger picture, the types of projects that they would like to make, or the ROI that would, they would get out of the machine if they decide to get into business and make products. The machine will eventually pay for itself. And then there's the longer term picture. Here's what usually happens. They'll either buy too small of a machine because money was dictating that, or they will buy a machine that is uh, not as strong and ends up with a lot of rigidity issues in their project or in the machine that translates into the project. What I will say to you is this. Don't buy a small machine. If you have your eyeballs on a machine of this size, stick with that, even if it's going to hurt the budget a little bit. Because in the long run, you will be very happy that you made that decision. In fact, if you are watching this video and you have purchased a machine and you realize that you knew you wanted a bigger one, but your budget held you back, then make a comment down below. Talk about it so any other viewers that watch this review understand this concept. Don't buy a small machine. Think about what you want to make first and then let that dictate the machine. It might be a little bit of a pinch on the budget at first, but you won't regret the decision. Now I'd like to talk to you about what comes with the long mill when you order the base unit. When you order your long mill, you will get 
the CNC machine itself. That would be this whole contraption right here minus the router. Now, that might seem kind of weird. I'll talk about that in a minute because it's actually good. The other thing you will get is the control box or the brains that actually runs the machine. And then you will get the power switch, or emergency stop switch, and the power supply. So you may be wondering, why do you have to actually have the router as an add-on as opposed to getting it with the machine? The answer is actually a really smart answer. And there's three reasons for that. Number one is some people already have this Makita router in their shop. Like me, I've got two others of the exact same router. Had they not been committed to other things, then I wouldn't have even had this, this as an add-on with my long mill. The second reason is some people prefer to use other routers, perhaps a DeWalt or Ryobi. And so why would you want to get the Makita? And the third reason is some people want to get a spindle instead of a router. Now to tell you what the difference is, a spindle is a motor that is controlled by the controller of the machine. It gets turned on and off through the G-code of the machine and the spindle speed is set by the G-code. Whereas this type of router is a standalone machine. It has a power switch, you can take it off and start doing things by hand. So those are the three reasons why Long Mill has left that as an add-on option. One of the things they have done to accommodate this in a much better way for you as the buyer is they have multiple different mounting brackets for the routers. For example, this is a 65 millimeter mounting bracket for the Makita router. They also have different sizes for the different size routers and the spindles. So you have options when you buy the machine. One of the nice things about the spindle aspect of this is the control box has the connectors so you can plug a spindle right into this machine. So the spindle has control here. You have coolant control here if you're gonna be cutting metal such as aluminum or brass or steel. And yes, you can cut steel on this if you follow certain protocols. The control also has limit switch settings or access here so you can get limit switches set up in the machine. Now, one of the things I just wanna point out is the long mill does not have limit switches mounted on the machine nor does it have a homing sequence. I talked to Long Mill about this and they said that in the beginning they just made the machine for hobby level type of people who would maybe do one or two off jobs. But now they're realizing that people are actually doing production work on this machine. So they are actively, as of this video, coming up with a limit switch and homing sequence for this machine for the people who are using it more for production purposes. I'm very happy to hear about that and you should see that within the next month or two. The next thing I'd like to talk to you about is the drive system that the long mill comes with. Now, first of all, let's talk about the stepper motors. The long mill uses NEMA 23 stepper motors. These are the best stepper motors in the class, and you will find four of them on the machine. There will be two for the Y axis, one for the Z axis, and one for the X axis. The stepper motor for the Z axis is mounted underneath a bracket, comes up, has a timing belt that comes across and is attached to the screw that makes the machine move up and down. I see that Long Mill could have put it up on top and mounted it directly to the screw, but I can see that they decided to put it out of the way so it's just not exposed to whatever it might be exposed to. It's okay as far as I'm concerned the way they did that. The next is, what is actually making the machine move around like this? Well, that's part of the drive system that I want to discuss with you now. Uh, there are three types of drive systems. There's the belt drive, the screw drive, and the rack and pinion. Now, rack and pinion you won't find in this class of machine. That's more for industrial level. But you will find the timing belt and the screw drive. So I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the difference between the two. Timing belts are okay. They're strong and they last quite a while. They do have a tendency to wear and eventually break. Just so you know, timing belts are in your car. So that gives you an idea of the how they can be used and that they are durable. The long mill uses a screw drive. So let's talk about screw drives for a minute. There are two types. There's the ball screw and the Acme thread. The ball screw is designed for extremely high precision. Now we're talking ten thousandths of an inch. You'll find ball screw on industrial level machines like machines that machine out your car engine or airplane parts. The 
Long Mill uses an Acme thread, which is slightly less precise. The Acme thread is actually much stronger. Every axis on this machine that moves around is driven by the Acme thread. There's the X axis that has one Acme screw. The Z axis that has one screw. And the Y axis that has two screws, one on the left and one on the right. Now there's one more thing I want to talk to you about when it comes to the Acme thread versus a ball screw. All machines, no matter how precise they're made at the highest industrial level, have a degree of play in them. That play is called backlash. When it comes to the Acme screw, there's a little bit more backlash than you might find in a ball screw. But there's an ingenious little solution that has been adopted for all types of machines that use the Acme thread. It's called the anti-backlash nut. Now the degree of play that I'm talking about is very small, but it's still something to compensate for. In the Acme thread, this is how they do it. This is the anti-backlash nut. So it has the Acme thread going all the way through the nut, and it's got this little fork here and a screw on it. And so that screw separates the nut a little bit to pull the thing tight on either side of the threads, and that eliminates all the backlash that you may find on an Acme thread. Long Mill uses it for every Acme thread that they have. So for your Y-axis Acme thread, it is back here, right up in there. It's held in by these two screws right there. And there's one on the other side as well. On the X-axis, which is going back and forth like that, there is one on this side of the machine right down in here. Now there's not one on the other side, but there is room for that, like holes that are punched in. So you can put this on there and I will probably dismantle mine and put this spare one on this side of the X travel. And then there's one on the Z travel. You can see it right here. So this will take care of virtually all the play that you might get out of an Acme thread. One of the things that I do want to say about the long mill when it comes to the assembly, which I will talk to you about in just a little while, they suggest that you use this bolt for the Acme thread for ease of access to adjusting it. The bolt sticks up a little high out of here, and it sticks out the side of the machine over here, and it'll stick out the front over here. I don't like that because it actually takes up a little bit of the travel of the machine where these will actually bump at the top right here on the Z. It'll bump on this side on the X and it'll bump on the feet here at the end of the screw head. And you can see it takes up about three quarters of an inch or maybe 20 millimeters of travel that you lose when you have these bolts in there. However, they also give you the set screws that come with these. The set screws sit flush here, which I have put on my machine. You can see right there is the set screw. We'll zoom in just a little bit. There you can see it. I recommend that when you put your long mill together, don't use the screw that they suggest. I would use the set screw just so you have all that room. One of the things that I see on the Z axis going up and down, when it comes up, this bolt actually hits this nut. So definitely in your Z axis, replace this with that one that gets that comes with the machine when you get it. At this point, we've covered some of the basics about the long mill, who makes it, the machine size, and a bit of the drive system and what you get with it. Now it's time to get into how this thing is built and then we'll get into the assembly. I just want to ask you at this point, if you feel like you're starting to get some good information about this machine and this review, then if you would, give me a thumbs up. And you might want to subscribe if you're brand new to CNC routers because you'll get a lot of training on this channel. Okay, so let's talk about the construction of this machine, one of the parts that's my favorite. The long mill router looks a little strange with these V rails like this and it just seems to be like there's something missing on this machine. Well, the engineers that designed this obviously from my perspective dismantled the whole concept of what a CNC router should look like and decided to figure out a way to build it so it's very rugged and at the same time reduce the number of parts in it so that they can make it less expensive for you. And that translates into a very good price on this machine.
So let's talk about the construction of this and what they did. I'm going to give you a little bit of an engineering training here as we move along because I really want you to understand why this machine is as rigid as it is. So we're going to start off with the Y rails first. That's these two here and then we'll get into the X and then we'll get into the Z. Know that that rail on that side is the mirror image of this one on this side, so it's exactly the same thing. So I'm going to explain it over here. Typically on a CNC router, there are three components that ride through the length of the machine on the long travel. There will be two bars and the drive screw or the belt, whatever it may be, that's passing through. And those bars act as the guide for the gantry to run along. When those bars have such a long travel, they'd be mounted from one end all the way to the other over here. There is a bit of flex that you will find in the middle of it. Basically, you have bars here they can flex. In the long mill, they opted out of the three bar system and went with a V type of rail that is very thick. This is extruded aluminum, which is very important and you'll understand in just a moment. It's two inches by two inches by a quarter of an inch. That would be 50 millimeters by 50 millimeters by six millimeters. Very thick and heavy piece of extruded aluminum. The thing with extruded aluminum is it's extruded at a very precise size. So when it's made, you can count on the size of all the tolerances to be very consistent throughout the entire length. And the long mill took advantage of that by using this not only as the structure of this part of the machine, but also as the rail guides to move the gantry along. They use these V-shaped wheels that ride along the corners on the top and the bottom. So that was brilliant by combining the structure with the travel aspect. The other thing that they did was they bolted this thing down in four different places along the length while they kept it clear for the travel. So there's only one foot approximately 12 inches or 300 millimeters between each foot on here. So that makes this bracket or structure, guard, guide rail, whatever you want to call it, extremely strong when it's bolted down. Now I want to say something. I've had a lot of people ask me, are the feet made of plastic? Yes, they are. Now, one of the things with plastic is there are lots of different grades of plastic, and there are hard plastics, soft plastics, malleable plastics. Long Mill knew that, and so they used a hard plastic that didn't have a lot of flux to it or uh, whatever you might want to call it. It does have a bit more brittleness. They actually make these themselves, but you can see that they actually understood that. These are very stocky brackets. It's about an inch and a half wide, over a quarter of an inch thick, and it goes all the way down, and it's the same thing on all these. So I don't worry about this being plastic. The only thing that did bother me about these was the mounting holes. There's two of them in each leg. There's one here and one over here. I would rather them be big enough for me to put an M6 or a quarter 20 bolt through to bolt this thing down. So maybe a suggestion for you long mill when you uh, go back and just kind of look at some things that you might want to amp that up. But at the same time, you have two screws on each leg all the way down. It's two over there. So that makes 16 screws holding this whole machine down. It is on the table. It's not going to come off. These roller bearings, the bearings themselves that the gantry moves with, the V-shaped wheels, the bearings are steel bearings. The wheels themselves, the V wheels, are made of a plastic called Delrin. Now Delrin is a machinable plastic. It's hard. It's used in machining, uh, industrial machines, in moving parts when you want to protect the surfaces but still have the strength of near metal in a moving part. So. Delrin was a very good option to be using on this. One of the things I noticed when I had this on there and I tightened it down that some of the Delrin was peeling off as it traveled back and forth. Now I think that was my fault because 
in the instructions they say to just bring these wheels together snug there's like a little cam screw in the back of the top ones that you tighten and it'll tighten the wheel down to the frame here and they say just to snug it down I went a little tight on it and so I think the wheel just had to reform itself to the rail after it did that then the plastic stopped coming off and the wheel is now formed or reformed to the rail so we have V wheels here and we have V wheels on the other side and the other thing that's really brilliant about that is the V wheels they will not slip off there is no play they can't have play which makes this any side to side movement out of the picture so that's the first part of the rigidity that's why this part of the long mill looks so unusual one of the last points I want to make about this concept that they used is the low profile that they built this machine on. So from the tabletop to the bottom of the rail is maybe about an inch and a half or 38 millimeters. So with that combined with all these legs there's very little opportunity for flex at all and they took the front legs and you can see there's a brace right here to stop any opportunity of that happening and the same thing is down at the back leg the only reason they don't have that here is because they needed to leave clearance for the roller bearings to come through underneath right here so all these things combined make this whole concept extremely rigid despite the lack of using multiple posts that run all the way across the machine. The biggest key element here is that by using the design concepts that they used, they were able to remove any opportunity of flex that might show up in the middle of the machine. Then we get to the gantry. This is another piece of, <laughs> I don't know what you call it, it's rock solid. Oh, I just want to say, you can see the size bolts that they're using to hold this onto the beam there. These are M8 bolts or 5 16 bolts if you're in inches, roughly the same size. Okay, the gantry. I just wanted to stop for a second and say what I'm about to explain to you is engineering level stuff. This is what engineers take into account and discuss when they are talking about structure and designing structure into buildings or bridges or CNC routers in this case. What Long Mill did was basically take apart the conventional CNC router and reinvented its construction where they were able to engineer in a heck of a lot more rigidity than you would find in the conventional design of CNC routers. Mind-blowingly whatever you want to call it for me as an engineer the design was brilliant so sit back enjoy a little education and engineering as you start to learn as to why the long mill is such a strong machine the two sides of the gantry are steel plates these brackets here this one and that one and they are six millimeters thick or a quarter of an inch thick and when you hold them in your hand you're like there's a couple pounds set in here. In fact, when you get your package in, I want to say when you pick it up, you know you've got something heavy or robust because I think the package probably weighs maybe 40, 50 pounds. It took two of us to bring it through the shop and down to here. So anyway, so the two side brackets are very stocky, sturdy steel. Then you have the gantry or the bridge of the gantry that goes across. Now you can see here it is cut into the side so it fits right into the bracket and then it's using the same M8 bolts for them on this side here to, to hold this bracket here and then this bracket here and then four of them going into each side there. And I want to show you the bracket too. Now this is a little bit more than an eighth of an inch, maybe three or four millimeters. These are steel brackets, so this is going nowhere. And it's a mirror image again on the other side right over here. Now the other thing, and this is the engineering part that blew me away. We have another piece of angled extruded aluminum. This one is three inches by three inches by quarter inch or 75 millimeters by 75 by six mil. 
very stocky piece of aluminum and it too is extruded so you can account on the the accuracy of the width being consistent all the way down now there's also a second one bolted to the first one the same size and there are one two three four five six bolts uh, m8 bolts that are holding that one in as i was assembling this I could see what Long Mill was experiencing as they were developing the machine and troubleshooting it for issues. And I could tell that when they first did it, they just used the same concept here as they used right here, but they didn't have the luxury of being able to bolt in multiple places like they did with the legs. And given the nature of a triangle, in the middle, there is going to be vibration that goes like that. Now, this is another element that contributes to that, and that's called a moment of inertia. I want you to think of a plane, like an invisible plane that goes through this angle right there, and another one that goes through that angle right there. That moment of inertia indicates the strength of materials when it comes to engineering. And as you know, in a triangle, or in this piece, the strongest area is going to be right up at the point. That's where the two planes of the moment of inertia intersect. Now when it comes to a triangle, you have these two planes. And they're strong, the strength is in, those. the strongest point is right up here where the two planes intersect. However, the triangle in this machine is not closed. It's an open triangle, so it's missing a plane that would cross into the other corners. And that creates a certain amount of weakness in the material or an ability to twist. All materials, when it comes to structure, has these moments of inertia and they're very important when it comes to building equipment. Tubes have a moment of inertia that goes around the tube. The strongest one is a square, where you have four planes that intersect, so you have four of the strongest points and they are attached to each other by each plane. What Long Mill did, by attaching this bracket or piece of aluminum to the back, essentially created a square. This is a theoretical concept that, an en that engineers would use. So you know that we have a plane that goes through here and a plane that goes down through this part of the thing. Now we have another plane right here and another plane right here. So you can imagine this plane passes through and comes up this way. This plane comes up this way. In engineering theory, that's the equivalent of taking this piece and making it over here where the plane comes up and the plane comes up that way, therefore forming that square. But this is even stronger than that because now we're doubled up in the thickness right here. And usually when you double up in structure or other things like that, you actually increase the strength by a factor of four. So this whole entire gantry is so strong, I can stand on it and not worry about it. And this is what I'm talking about. I don't worry one bit about standing on this. Watch this. I can run the machine while I'm standing on it, as long as I keep my balance. This machine is strong. Now you understand about the structure of the gantry and why it's so strong. So these two things combined. This machine is very rigid. Now let's talk about the z-axis. So the z-axis itself is made of the same plate steel as the brackets here. Six millimeters or a quarter of an inch. There's two components. You have this back component here which actually runs on the machine. You can see there's the v-wheels are right in there and they're bolted right here, here, and then down where you can't really see it right now. Oh yeah, it is. it's right uh, there. The plate that rides up and down that the router mounts to is also six millimeters. So these two are very thick, very heavy. You pick them up and go, my God, I mean, this is like way too much, <laughs> but it's great. And then they have this plate up here, which is a little bit thinner. It's a mounting plate for the, the motor and your drag chain. 
and we'll talk about that during the assembly. The z-axis goes up and down on linear rails, and those linear rails have linear bearings that ride up and down with it. So looking at the front of the machine, you can see that it's pretty wide right here, which gives it a lot of squareness that way. The other way that you may see in machines that have the z-rail is they'll use tubes instead of the linear rails. It's kind of six to one half dozen the other. This is very common in the majority of CNC routers in this class and they work quite well. So as I explained before there's a nut right there and then that goes up and comes up here. Now there is a plastic component here that this upper bracket mounts to and a plastic component is bolted into the the x-axis gantry carriage that's actually what this whole assembly is called is a carriage and it comes back around the back and then the motor attaches to actually to the plate that plastic piece just serves as attaching this element to this element now this is very stocky they definitely took into account any brittleness that might be in a plastic by just building in the body into it one of the things that I did have when I received the machine was that there's this piece actually wraps around the motor kind of slips up through a slot in the middle and you can see right here there's a little piece that's missing it actually broke in shipment so it's probably the only component that was a little bit loose in the box when it was shipped I didn't worry about that because it has nothing to do with the structure of the component or anything holding it in place it was just there so I didn't contact long mill about it however I do know based on the many Facebook posts that I read that long mill would have responded immediately and sent me a brand new one so the next level about this is the attachment of the router or the router bracket to the the slide rail so this is held in with four bolts in the back they're M5 bolts and of all the rigid area of the machine this is probably the weakest of the areas just because it's just a you know thinner piece it's hanging out a little bit they kept the the router quite close to the body and the only other thing about that that flex or any other issues is typical in routers you have compound effects so you have wheels here and then you have wheels there and then you have a, uh, another bearings here and then you have a hangout there so all that when it comes down to it the most flexible part of the machine is going to be right down here this is pretty typical in most machines what I probably would like to see is maybe a little bit thicker bracket but from what I've done with the running of the machine so far it has not been an issue whatsoever so that is the Z carriage how it works and then we have the wiring that comes through so that pretty much covers the structure of this whole machine as you know I'll how I already stand on this from an engineering standpoint it is an exceptionally well done design now we're going to get into the assembly of the machine was it easy was it hard how long did it take were there any issues now before I get to that Again, like I said before, if you are brand new to CNC routers or looking to figure out how to make some money using one of these machines, then you want to subscribe to this channel and maybe hit the notification bell so that you know when I am putting out another video. There are a lot of videos on this channel that will guide you through both things at a layman's level where the beginner can basically just walk up the ladder. A lot of step-by-step -step stuff. The most common question I get about the assembly is how long does it take? It will take you two hours to put this machine together. The tools that you'll need are a pair of pliers, a, an adjustable wrench. Uh, by the way, they have a wrench that comes with the machine when you get it. You will need a small screwdriver and a set of metric Allen wrenches. The assembly overall went together quite easily. There were a couple of situations where something had to be pressed into something else and I needed to use the back end of a screwdriver to press it in. It's not bad. It's like uh, this anti-backlash nut. You needed to press the nuts into the nut body itself. That's good. So you're not dropping nuts and on the ground and losing them. 
So there was a couple that was actually a little tricky to get them pressed in. Maybe took five, 10 minutes to really figure out how to make it work. But other than that, the machine pretty much fell together as I followed the instructions. Now there are two sets of instructions to assemble this machine. Don't worry, they're not different. One is a video instruction. It's made by Chris Thorogood, one of the owners. And he walks you through the entire thing through a video. It's actually kind of fun to watch. Chris is just kind of this happy-go-lucky guy and says, now you grab this and you're going to take this and we're going to do this. And, and he's always smiling as he's doing it. So it was kind of fun. A little long. It's about four hours long, I think, if I remember right. The other instructions are the paper instructions, what you'll find on the website. Now, that's the one I primarily followed. The paper instructions were laid out very well, and they kind of had the same theme, theme that Chris had. It's very conversational, not like really dry and technical. You kind of felt like a friend was telling you how to build the thing. Now we're going to take this screw and we're going to put it into this part. Now, one of the things I want you to be careful of is doing this and that. And that's the way that you kind of read it. So it was kind of fun and casual as you're going through it. The one thing that I would say could have used a little bit of an improvement is when you get all your parts, they, of course, you've got your big parts like the rails and the router, and then you have all your small parts, the bolts, and they come in color-coded bags. So it's just like this. That's one of them right there, a yellow one. There's a red one. There's a green one, I think. In the instructions that for each segment of the assembly, right up front, they tell you what are the parts that you need. And the nice thing is they don't really complicate it. You'll need about five parts per assembly, so it's not like you're laying out a whole bunch of stuff. The, the area where I was like, it could have been improved a little bit. It's an inconvenience, but it wasn't significant enough to say, you've got to revamp your entire system, was the instructions would have me go from this bag to this bag, back to this bag, then I've got to use these two bags. So basically, throughout the assembly process, the parts were pulled out of the bag multiple times. The, there's little baggies in the, in the bags, by the way, and each one is clearly labeled so you know exactly what you're getting. It's clearly labeled on the instructions the exact same way. But you're going from bag to bag. What I would rather see is one bag, colored green, and it has all the hardware for that particular type of assembly. And then the instructions say, grab the green bag. Other than that, you know, it's, it's not that big of a deal. I don't know, maybe long mill you need to revamp your whole process to change the color coding on your bags. So anyway, they did the instructions in segments. It was very easy to follow. There are some times where you're maybe not sure how tight you should make bolts. So you want to use your common judgment on that. You never over tighten bolts and you never leave them loose, put it that way. So that was the overview of the instructions. I did run into a couple of minor issues that I was able to resolve myself. Again, like I said, when I had that broken bracket that I knew I could call a long mill and get parts sent down to me, I didn't want to wait two days to get those parts. I had the stuff in my shop to fix it. So I'll explain that here in just a moment. So let's get a little bit more into the assembly of this thing and show you kind of how this goes together and what you need to watch out for. What I want to do is just cover the stages of the assembly, not particularly in the order that they are written, but just the different elements of the assembly. So one of the elements, of course, are the two legs that are going, the Y rails that are going back and forth holding the gantry. The next is putting the gantry together, and then you're assembling the carriage to the gantry. Now, one of the things that was nice was the carriage comes pre-assembled. So this part with the bearings and the bearing rails and the back body are all one assembly. One of the things that I ran into that I want to make note for you when you buy your long mill and start to assemble it is I assumed that the bolts that are holding the rails in and holding the bearings on were all tight because it's pre-assembled. So you have screws on the back here and they run all the way down. Well, they are not brought to the tightness that they need to be. So before you assemble yours onto here, make sure you tighten these screws down that are holding the rails in and the bearings. You just want to be careful. You don't want to over tighten on the bearings. You can strip screws out and you just don't want to do that. So use your common sense when you're doing that. The 
carriage assembly went together quite easy. There's the motor that attaches to the bracket. The bracket attaches to this plastic mounting piece. This attaches to this bracket. And then from the V-wheels, everything attaches to here. And then, of course, you attach the, the router bracket to that before you put everything on. It is important to make sure that everything is attached before you do it. Now, one of the things is this little side bracket here, that is for the magnetic uh, dust shoe mount. You don't put this on until later. I will talk about this in a little while. On the back of this bracket is your drag chain. And all your wires run through the drag chain. And you can see right here that the wires come right out of one drag chain and into the next. And they run out to the end of the machine there. The wires come across here, but there is no dragging or, or braiding here because they are not coming across the moving part. So I like that, that there is no chance of these wires being abraded through where they can short out on the machine. What I did find interesting was the bracket right here that holds this part of the drag chain. This thing is like super beefy. It is not going anywhere. Then you'll run your wires through and they'll come out this end. Now the wires for the Y motors, the wire for this one will drag along the back. So when you mount yours on a table, you want to drill a hole below the motor, run the wire down, and run it back out over here so that if you pass your part through, you don't catch onto the wire. That's a really easy fix. The one thing is those two wires, this is the two motor wires, wires. they come up and there's on one of the legs they have little clips right here where the wires can just hook up into. You want to make sure they get hooked up in there and then everything bundles up just out here and you have plenty of room where you can move your control box around. So that was a well thought out design with the drag chain and I like that they took advantage of this bracket on the gantry to act as a guide for the drag chain. You can see it's just laying on the little step there. So that was uh, a little ingenious little uh, afterthought that they said oh we can just use that instead of creating a stop or something. It's fun to see how they engineer this stuff up. The gantry itself went together very easily and as did the legs. Now the stepper motors, this is one of the cases where you can see there's a nut that's pressed into a little pocket there. That's where sometimes you have a little bit of a challenge getting those pressed in. I would take a rubber mallet too and I'd tap it down. Sometimes it's a little tricky to get it to sit flat before you press it down. And then they use these standoffs that will keep the motor in place and give it the proper spacing and they have the couplers there. The coupler can only go on one way. The motor shaft is slightly different than the shaft on the screw. And then there's a couple washers right inside that actually act as slip washers. Uh, and on, a, on that note, I would suggest that you use a little light oil when you're putting this together or when you've got it together, put a drop of oil there or wherever you have spinning parts. Put a little drop of oil wherever they're rubbing together. You don't need that here on the wheels, on the guide wheels. So I want to point uh, one thing out that I would have liked to see on this. You can see that there's the, the screw and it comes out to the other end of the foot and then there's this little brass nut there with a screw in it right here. And the, the reason for this nut is to pull your Acme thread to a slight tension. Basically, over that long distance, if it's not relatively snug, then the Acme thread will wobble as it's, as it's coming up. And that wobble translates into maybe a little bit of uh, looser tolerances in your machine. So you want to bring that up and, and, and just give this a little bit of a snug when you get it assembled. This nut is an Acme nut. It fits on that thread. It's made of brass, so it doesn't scar the thread itself. However, there is a locking screw that goes through it, and that clamps down on the threads and holds the nut in place. 
I don't particularly like that method because number one, the screw, steel on steel, especially like this when you have precision, it can scar the threads. And if you need to disassemble it when you're unscrewing this nut, you can scar the nut. When you're clamping metal to metal, it's just in this fashion, I don't particularly like it. What I'd rather see long mill do is use a jam nut. So I'd like to see two brass nuts and then use one to jam against the other. That's just as strong or stronger than using a screw like that to lock it in place. Other than that, I don't really have a problem with it. Uh, one of the things was one of the nuts wasn't threaded. And it's this one right here. So the screw, I couldn't get it in there because there was no thread in the hole. So I had a tap in the shop and I just retapped my own. It was with a, it was a different thread, so I couldn't use the screw that was provided with it. I know that if I called long mill, they would have sent more if I needed it. I just didn't want to wait for that. Other than that, it's pretty easy. Um, there is no concern about the wires being in the way of the rollers so long as you make sure that they are out of the way over here and you see i have them bundled up and then i have them running into the control box as needed i will probably move the control box over just a little bit more so i can build an enclosure around this because you can see the x motor sticks out quite a bit over here uh, I think that's maybe that's why they put this thick bracket on here to help protect that motor from anything that might be sticking out. And the Y, the X motor is built up the same way as all the rest of them. And that is about all I have to say about the assembly. Again, overall, it went together fairly easily. Uh, one other thing I will add. I talked about this bracket here. And you can see there's holes there. So you can mount your router bracket either in those holes or the ones down below. Long mill says that if for more rigidity, put it on the upper holes for less, you know, put it on the lower holes. I don't really see that much of a difference. There's the other brass screw. They're using M8 bolts to hold this plastic in place. You can see there's multiple bolts holding everything down there. So that's the assembly. As far as the dust shoe, one of the things that is kind of cool with this, it's magnetic. So this is the dust shoe right here that you buy with the machine. And it's got some pretty powerful magnets. The bracket mounts to the right side of the carriage and sticks out this side. So one of the drawbacks to that is the bracket actually takes up about an inch and a half worth of travel over here. For the most part, most CNCers won't miss that extra loss because most of their projects are going to be in the middle of the table. However, I do say that this was a really cool little design, the way they thought this out. And I can tell they used the same concepts to design this as they did in the machine. So it's very user-friendly. The way this works is you get your machine all set up and you'll basically set your brush down on your project surface and then run it back until, well, my router's a little bit too low at the moment. There we go. And then you'll just slip it in and the magnets hold it in place. And then you'll slip your vacuum tube right up here and start to run it. What's really cool is they put in a little bit of a window there so you can watch what's going on. And I think that they probably should have put windshield wipers on that for when it's raining. <laughs> So there's a little bit of a gap back here. That's for that clearance so that the dust shoe can slip over. I don't think that's a big deal. The, there's, there's enough air coming through there. It's going to suck in all that air from back there and probably help create a little vortex. I actually haven't used this yet, so we'll find out very shortly. I would absolutely recommend when you buy this machine that you just incorporate the dust boot with it. Don't try to build your own like I used to. Just get it. They've already done all the work to design it. Save yourself the effort so you can start making projects rather than solving problems. One of the other things that does not come with this machine is a spoil board. They have a lot of information on their website. And when you go to the website, you'll see that there are so many resources they provided. Uh, for example, like spindles. They gave you reference 
references for spindles, but they have uh, references for spoil boards. You know, community members contribute to it. And as far as the table. So, you know, my table is 48 deep by 58 wide. And that's very accurate, uh, very adequate for what I'm doing. And I just built up my com control area off on the side. So when it comes to the assembly, it was really actually quite easy. The instructions were easy to follow. The issues I had were very minor. I know that I could have had them resolved with long mill if I needed to have that resolved. Overall, the assembly was easy. Two hours, you'll have it built. And then get your spoil board, go down to the hardware store, have them cut a piece of, of MDF, build your table, and you'll be ready to go. I want to say, watch a video that I put out. I'll put a link down below about the spoil board. In this segment, we're going to talk about the control software that runs the long mill CNC router. So if you're brand new to this and you're wondering what I'm talking about, the control software is your interface to the CNC router so you can see what it's doing and you have some control over it. For the techies out there, the long mill is Adreno based with the gerbil on top of that as firmware. And if you're brand new, don't worry, every CNC router you're looking at in this class is Adreno based. So the control software, there are three important aspects about it. The robustness of it, the user friendliness or intuitiveness of it, and the features that are included with it. So control software, just to start off, looks something like this, where you have a display that shows what your CNC router is going to be doing, how it's going to move around. So these marks are called toolpaths. So you'll be able to watch it move around with a little icon that moves around. You'll be able to tell what's done, how much longer it has to go. You also have manual interface right here where you can tell the machine to move. And then you have an area where you can do manual data input, where you can type in information if you want the machine to do certain things. The thing with control software that's important is the robustness, the user friendliness, and the functionality or the features. So there's a whole bunch of them out there. The one you're going to hear most of is called Universal G-Code Sender. That's been out there as the number one control software for quite some time. However, it's starting to get a little out of date and it's got some bugs in it that's not catching up with the current Windows themes. And Long Mill has worked with that for quite a long time. They started looking at one called G-Sender. And this is the one I want you to remember and the one I want you to get, G-Sender. G-Sender is more up-to-date, it's more robust, and it's more flexible for them to work with and to get the bugs out of it. And so they've actively been working with it to make sure that it works with the long mill. On top of that, they've been adding features to it. For example, surfacing the spoil board. Spoil board is the board where you clamp your project down. When you put your router together, the majority of the tabletop spoil board is not parallel with the motion of the router. So you have to surface it to get it parallel with it. So up until now, we've had to design our own spoil board surfacing programs, and that's prone to errors. Well, Long Mill added a feature to the G-Sender where it will actually write it for you. You just type in the dimensions of your machine or the motion, the maximum movement of your machine, and it'll write it for you. That's really nice because that eliminates a lot of errors. They've added so much stuff to this, I can't really cover it here. But what I can say is because they are actively, literally every week working on it to make sure it works with this machine, that you can be really comfortable that it is working with your machine and it will work with your machine. But the other thing is, is it doesn't just work with a long mill. It works with any Adreno-based machine. So if you go out and buy another CNC router, you can get their G-Sender off their website. It's free, by the way. And that will run your machine. You'll have all these features added into it that all the other control softwares do not have. And just on the note of control softwares, there are a ton of them out there. There is some junk. Ones that don't have a manual data input where you can actually type in some code if you need to, that really ties your hands behind your back as far as having some control over your machine. So you want to make sure you have those features. Just get the G-Sender, you'll be set. And the other thing that's nice about G-Sender is it's such a clean, easy screen to work with. Very 
uh, uncluttered, intuitive, as opposed to like Universal G Code Sender, which is boxy and a little frustrating to try to get things positioned the way you want. So G Sender, G Sender, G Sender, just get that and be done with it. What I like about that too is long mill. They're actively working on something that any CNC router can work with. And you can get it free off their website. So that's kind of it with the control software. Any Adreno based control software will work with a long mill. Just get the G sender and be done with it. But I want to get onto their website for just a minute because I want you to know uh, something about long mill that I've discovered that also put them over the top. When you have been researching your CNC router, you go to the website, you see specs, you see prices, you see uh, add-ons, and then you check out. Long mill has gone miles beyond that. You see, they want to be a resource for the CNC router community at large. So they have all kinds of resources within their website, external links to take you to different places for whatever you want to know, such as table builds for your long mill or whatever machine you get. There's a lot of designs there. So there's access to where you can, links to where you can get free uh, files to run. There's the advanced stuff for the DIY, I'm gonna build my CNC router from scratch type, and all the information for the totally new green beginner. What I like about this is they are constantly working on it to make sure the community has like a one-stop shop to go to. In fact, that's my resource now. I don't even look on Google and try to search something out. I just go to the Long Mills website and I'm still discovering stuff on there. They are really trying to help everyone who's into CNC routing, whether they're a customer or not. So that's one of the things that also takes them over the top. They're not just a sales site about me, let's make a sale. They're there to make your CNC experience a heck of a lot better. So that's about it with this segment about the control software and the website. If you are at a point where you're like, okay, Garrett, this is going on for a long time and you just want to start digging around their website, down below in the description, the very first line is a link to their website so you can go check it out and start seeing what I'm talking about and reviewing their machine. What we're going to do now is we are going to get into a test drive on the machine, then we'll talk about the cost. Well, this is the part of the video that you've been waiting for, where the rubber meets the road. We are going to put the long mill through some paces. Now, before we move on with that, I just want to ask if you feel like you've been gaining a lot of knowledge about CNC routers, not just about the long mill CNC router, but in general, that helps your shopping experience. Give me a thumbs up if you haven't done it already. All right. So walking this thing through its paces. The first thing I want to tell you is we are not going to be checking this for accuracy or prettiness. I've already done that in other videos and there are links down below for those videos. The intention of this segment is to see if I can find the limits of the long mill CNC router. So I want you to understand when we're doing a limit check, there are four things that can give way with a CNC router. You have the, the clamps that actually hold your project down. They can give way. There's the router bit. It can break. There is the spindle or the router itself that's actually rotating the, the router bit. That can bog down and quit in the middle of a cut. And finally, <clears throat> there's the CNC machine. The thing that's actually moving everything around. So the idea is to hope that the CNC machine will be, over, be able to overpower all these other things so I'm going to be ramming this thing through some really, really aggressively, stupidly hard paces to see if I can make the machine quit. So I'm hoping I will break bits. I'm hoping that clamps will give way. I'm hoping that the router itself will bog down. I will break bits in the process. And what I want to see is the, is the long mill continuing to move on and check it for all the things along the way. So. Let's just get started and see how this thing performs. The first bit that I decided to run was the bowl bit. A bowl bit is used to hog out a lot of material fairly quickly and it does a really good job. So this is a three quarter inch diameter bowl bit and I am cutting at a quarter inch deep 
with a 40% step over at 100 inches per minute. And it was just running right through it. The only time it seemed to make some noise was when it was jumping out for its next run. So what you're seeing right now is it's ramping into its cut. The bull bit was doing very well and nothing was bogging down on this. Try to get a close up of it. It was too late. As you can see we got a good finish. I have to do a little bit of sanding. That's pretty normal with this bit. Handled it quite well. The next was the surfacing bit. This is the one that I sell through IDC, the one inch by one quarter inch and using the touch plate. And I tell you what, you've got to use touch plate. It's so easy. So what I did was cut the full diameter and the full depth of the bit. Now, just keep in mind, we're cutting oak here, a hard wood. And this is also 100 inches per minute at a quarter inch deep. So that's about 40% there on the step over, but you see here it's going at 70%. And just running right through it. There is no issue whatsoever on the machine, the router, anything. So you can see how fast it's cleaning this cut out. And you can see that the cut itself is quite good. If you want this type of surfacing bit, I do sell them. There's a link down below in the description. You see how much material that thing took out. These are the kind of chips that you want to see off your machine, by the way. Nice big chips. That means your bit is cutting quite well. When you get dust like this, and a lot of it, that means your feed rate is too slow. You need to bring your feed rate up. I decided I was going to cut into this some more to bring that surface down to the bottom surface of the bowl. And you can see right there this little burn mark. That's because when I first re-ran the program I didn't change the parameters so it started to run along the same area. I stopped it and it paused there. So if a bit is turning and sitting idle it's going to start burning the wood. <coughs> Everything came out good. I didn't push the machine hard enough. So it was time to push it a little bit harder. This time, we're going to use the 3 16th diameter down cutting bit <coughs> on the oak. This has a 1 inch flute length. And we are going to cut the full depth of the bit. Now this is ridiculous as far as the depth of the cut. And we are going to go at 100 inches per second, or per minute. And you see this is one inch thick. Now I want you to pay attention to when the bit enters the wood. You're going to see it jump just a little bit. If you didn't see it, I'm going to do it again. This is classic of a down bit. When you're putting that much force, it's going to push itself up. Now watch. You see that little pop? It broke the bit. And it took a little bit to understand what just happened. But I'm glad it did. You see the bit is sticking out quite a bit. It hit a knot. And that knot, when it hit it, is much harder. And it pushed the bit up. And that's why the whole thing jumped up like it did. But you see how much work it had to do to get through there. Jamming all the chips in there. Had it not been for the knot, it would have made its way all the way through. That upward force, I've done a video on that, the science of down bits. There will be a link down below because that has a big effect on the surface finish of your 
jobs, especially if but you've had bad cuts around letters. Now we're using a quarter inch down bit, <clears throat> and it's one inch deep, and it made a little bit of noise. I wasn't sure what it was. I was going too deep. We actually went, um, I'm sorry, seven, eight, uh, seven eighths deep. So we're going back into it. This is an upcutting bit, and you can see it's just riding right through the material. 100 inches per minute once again. I was really impressed with this. So the bit, the router performed very well. Everything performed well. I mean, the, the router itself bogged down just a little bit. This time, with the up bit, it went through the same knot. And didn't even flinch. So there's a difference between up bits and down bits. It's very significant. Nice clean corners. You can see how deep that was. I decided it was time to do something a little more relaxing, so I was going to do a little bit of acrylic. I was testing the O-flute bits that I now have in stock. I've got an eighth inch diameter and a quarter inch diameter. They'll be on the website shortly. Acrylic is fun to cut. It's different from glass. But you have the right bit, it comes out nice and clean. I decided to go with a Star Trek theme. So this really isn't pushing the machine, it was more testing these bits that I had just gotten stock. So this is the Star Trek badge. There is something that came out of this, though. <clears throat> it's the surface level of the, the machine. <clears throat> so I've surfaced the spoil board. And all throughout that cut, it cut away the acrylic. And only in one spot that it just touched the board. But you can see it left the plastic film, but cut all the way through. So that was a nice sign from the long mill. Now we're going to do some aggressive work with the 120 degree V-bit. We're going to cut a big deep slot at a deep cut. So we're pushing a bit. And I forgot to say, uh, change something on it. So it plunged all the way down into the part and pulled the part off. I stopped it. And you see the router was just moving right on. So I had to put on a new piece of board and start to do it again. You see it's ripping right through that material. I totally recommend a 120 degree V-bit. Especially when you're doing larger letters. This is also stocked on the IDC store. What I want you to see here is the cut it's going to make in just a moment. You see it's, it's just rolling right through that material. Very thick cut. And watch this next cut. How much material it has taken out. It's left a little line there, and I found out that it had, uh, I had a setting that was wrong. Still clean lines, even at that high feed rate, 100 inches per minute again. Full depth of cut of the bit. So what you just saw in that demonstration was pushing this machine as hard as I possibly could. And what we did not find was the limits of the long mill CNC router, which means it can handle some pretty aggressive stuff. We did see where it popped over that broken bit when it broke. That was good. I want, I'm glad I saw that when it happened because if it didn't, it would have broken a component in the machine. So I'm glad that that happened. No CNC router is going to be pushed the way we just pushed this one. As far as I'm concerned, the performance was exceptional and the machine itself held up beautifully. All right, so now we're going to get to cost. As I was doing my research to determine which CNC router I would be putting in my shop, there was a question that came up from time to time in Facebook groups. 
Someone would ask, why does the long mill cost so much less than the other CNC routers in this class? It's a good question. There's this idea that if something costs more, then it must be better quality. And oftentimes that's the case. Sometimes it's not though. Sometimes it's just perception. In the long mill's case, it stands tall with the top four CNC routers in this class, but it stands apart from them when it comes to this kind of stuff. Do you remember back in the early hours of this video when I was talking to you about the design of the long mill? How the designers were able to basically incorporate the motion of the machine and the drive system of the machine and the structure into very few components. That redesign of the whole concept of a CNC router and reducing the number of parts is one of the reasons why the cost is less. There's another reason. Wherever they could, they used off-the-shelf components, like the gantry there and the, the uh, legs right over there. By doing that, they avoided having to make custom parts for their machine. That saves a ton of money. There's a third thing they've done, and you will see this when you start building your long mill CNC router. They came from the idea of keeping it simple. You'll see that all the parts were processed in a very simple fashion. And when something is processed using simplicity in mind, keeping it easy, that keeps the cost down too. So with those three elements, the cost is significantly less. While at the same time, you've got a machine that, that has an amazing amount of rigidity and is production capable. It's going to last a very long time. as many, uh, what, far fewer parts to break down on, uh, on you. It's got a good company behind it as well. So it's interesting that this machine is $700 lower than its nearest neighbor. The long mill, as you see here, the, CNC, the long mill CNC router 30 by 30 with the Makita on it and the magnetic dust shoe, which I totally recommend you get, and the touch plate, which I absolutely totally recommend you get, cost roughly $1,500 US, give or take 100 or two, as of this video. They ship anywhere in the world, from what I understand. As far as the shipping costs, I don't know. You'll have to talk to Long Mill about that. But it's very nice that they'll ship anywhere. $1,500. And it still stands tall. Did you know that the Long Mill is among the top four CNC routers in this class? Based on all my research and understanding business and the machine itself, how it's designed and all those characteristics and how the company supports CNCers as a whole, I have a prediction about this machine. It was introduced to the market two years ago. And in that two-year period, it made its way into the top four. Very little advertising, mostly word of mouth, says a lot. With a business and that kind of idea, I can see that this machine will be, and I predict it, will be the number one CNC router in its class in two years. So now you know everything about the long mill CNC router, and I hope you know a whole lot more about CNC routers as a whole as you're making your decision on what machine you're going to be getting. I would say at this point, while the long mill is still fresh in your mind, Go down in the description, the very first line is the link to their website. Go there and take a look around and you can make your decision. Or you know, maybe it's not the machine for you, but at least you know and you'll know a lot more about the resources that are there and about the long mill. I want to thank you for hanging around all this time, an hour and a half, with me. And it's my honor to be giving you this information to help you become a better CNCer and to get the best machine possible. With that, I'm going to bid you adieu. Head on down there, click that link now, take a look at their website. This is Garrett, and I will talk to you next time.